Hello. We will now begin today's webinar. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. As you can see on our next slide, our topic today is Inspiring Journeys of Purpose, featuring our guest speaker, Goodwin House President and CEO, Rob Liebrich. This is the first in a series of coffee talks being offered by Goodwin House. While we enjoy this webinar format and have certainly gotten used to it over the last two years, we do look forward to hosting future coffee talks in our communities, giving those who attend an opportunity to see why residents thrive in the Goodwin House lifestyle. You will hear more about our upcoming coffee talks later in the program. This webinar is being recorded so that those not able to join us today can listen to the program when it's convenient for them. A link to the audio recording will be included in an email to all who registered, which will be sent out later next week. As you can see on our next slide, I am your moderator today. My name is Sue Dalton, and I am the sales director for Goodwin House. My team and I are responsible for sharing information about our life plan communities, Goodwin House Alexandria and Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads with people like you. I am not only an employee of Goodwin House, but as you can see, I'm also the daughter of a resident, which gives me a very unique perspective and an appreciation for Rob's vision for the organization, which uplifts my life but also my mom's. Before we begin our presentation, let's go over some housekeeping notes on the next slide. You will see the PowerPoint slides with our, and our featured speaker on your computer screen. You may want to adjust the volume on your computer if you're having any trouble hearing me right now or our speaker later. We have allowed time for questions and answers following the presentation. Let's review how you can submit a question. Feel free to enter a question at any time during the webinar in the webinar pane. This slide provides a visual instruction as to how to do that. I'll give you a minute or two to review it. You can see that we've pointed out the areas where you want to click in that pane so that you can enter a question and we'll be receiving all of your questions as you enter them. Okay, let's review our agenda on the next slide. I'll spend a few minutes today discussing the many ways that Goodwin House now serves older adults. Then our CEO, Rob Liebrich, will discuss the challenges we have faced in the last two years, growth in our industry, and the challenges facing all healthcare organizations now and into the future. We will conclude with audience questions from you. On the next slide, you'll see that Goodwin House has grown significantly since opening its first life plan community in Alexandria in 1967. You are likely familiar with our two life plan communities that are on the left-hand side of your slide, um, Goodwin House Alexandria and Bailey's Crossroads that uh, over 950 residents now call home. Additionally, we offer private duty home care to residents. We manage the Lewinsville Retirement Residence, an affordable solution for 180 residents, and we're very excited about our upcoming third campus to open sometime in 2025 in Loudoun County. We now serve over 3,500 older adults in the area, the majority of whom don't even live in one of our life plan communities. Goodwin House at Home serves over 210 members and Goodwin House Hospice and Goodwin House Home Health serve over 600 older adults in their homes. You'll hear from Rob a little bit more about Stronger Memory a brain health program that's now nationwide. As we transition to the next slide, it is my pleasure to introduce Rob Liebrich. Rob began his service as president and CEO of Goodwin House Incorporated in July, 2019. 
Prior to joining Goodwin House, Rob was the executive director of the Asbury Methodist Village, a not-for-profit life plan community in Gaithersburg, Maryland. He's also held many senior positions in marketing and operations for senior living organizations in the Washington, Baltimore metro area, as well as in the Pacific Northwest. As we transition to the next slide, please welcome Rob Liebrich. Thanks, Sue. Great to be with you. Really excited for this afternoon, and thank you to all of who have joined us today. Appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to learn more about our organization and be able to answer your key questions. Before we get really started into things, I do want to take a moment of silence with everyone. There's so much going on in the world, and it would be important to send good energy to all those that need it today. People in Ukraine, people in Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Haiti, Somalia, the list goes on and on, and maybe for some of you, some of your own loved ones, or maybe you yourself. So it'd be great. Thank you so much for that. I'm excited to talk with you today about our inspiring journeys of purpose, both for our staff and our residents and members that we serve and, hold, and overall. Uh, before I joined the organization, which was two and a half years ago, uh, like you, I did a lot of homework about the organization. And I was really impressed with three things that this organization I could see had clearly. One, it was a faith-based not-for-profit. It means that the organization was reinvesting its resources that it made back into its residents, its members, and its staff, instead of going to owners or shareholders. That's a big and important difference, and we'll talk more about that later today. Second thing I noticed was that there was a clear mission-driven organization. They had their mission that they believe by, lead by and believe in, and that was really important to me. So faith-based not-for-profit plus really strong mission, uh, those are two key ingredients for me that were important in looking at an organization. The third was and is that it's a very financially solid organization. During these times of ups and downs, having a financially solid organization means that the services that you expect will be delivered, that the staff that are counting on the paycheck, those paychecks will come. And there's no ambiguity to where our focus is and our stability is for the long term. The fourth element is this key element of innovation, not being satisfied with how you do things today, but willing to take chances on new ideas and new ways to operate. And so that innovation element is certainly important to me. A fifth ingredient that I couldn't know were, was about the people. That's something that you can't tell until you're a part of an organization. But I can tell you outright, the people are fabulous, both the residents, the members, and the staff. And I'm so excited and honored and humbled to be a part of this organization. As you look at the two pictures that are represented here to start with, uh, you'll get a sense that the organization has this belief in a bigger purpose, that these little free libraries, for example, many of you might have seen these in your neighborhoods, but putting up a little free library at both Goodwin House, Baylor's Crossroads, and Goodwin House, Alexandria, ideas that came from the residents, are allowing people in the general community to benefit from us in our residents, which is really a nice testament to how we operate, who we want to be. And the other picture is part of our equine therapy approach, which is a belief that dignity is something that everyone should have at all levels of care and all levels of their journey. And we're really excited to be able to provide such programs as equine therapy to our resident base. As we come into the next slide, you'll see a little bit about Goodwin House overall. You'll see our mission, which is to support, honor, and uplift the lives of older adults and the people who care for them. And there's a key element in this mission for me. One is that the word end. Uh, we look at our staff, our employees, and our residents and members in equal basis. We know we have to do well by both constituencies in order to be successful, especially in today's market. You'll also see a reiteration of some of the services we provide along the way but I thought I'd give you a little bit more details about who we are. We have uh, nearly 960 staff members today, which is amazing, on an average tenure of about six years. 
our turnover rates uh, run just under 30 percent and we represent over 60 countries with our staff uh, which is really really fun sue mentioned our work at lewinsville where we support uh, with financial support services and hr services uh, a hud 202 housing project which is now over 50 percent korean speaking uh, so a little bit different in its diversity we also have Medicare and Medicaid eligible services for certified home health and hospice services, which means that we're providing services to a very broad group of residents and members in the community. And we provide charity care as well, which is what you can expect from a faith-based not-for-profit. As we go on to the next slide, you'll see what I think are key macro things. Um, sorry, right after I give you an introduction of who I am. Uh, me at a glance. Uh, I'll, I'll get into the macro items in just a second, uh, but I do want to share a little bit of personal basis with you. So uh, my family is forefront. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's not part of my family, but this is at Roosevelt Island, uh, just around the corner. I ended up walking, living in uh, Roslyn for a number of years, really liking that uh, amenity that was available to us. And so you're seeing my family on one of our brownie walks, uh, something we do every January 1st. Uh, we bake brownies. And then we go find a place to take a hike. Uh, we get the exercise in, and then we make sure we have a sweetness to the new year by having a brownie. So it works out really well. Uh, you'll notice that there are uh, two dogs in here. And one of those dogs on the far left or right, depending on how you're looking at things, is my sister-in-law, Stephanie, and her dog, Sally. And we came back to the area after living in Seattle uh, for five years uh, to be closer to her and her family. And it's been really a great gift uh, to do so. But you'll see we have three children, my wife Jennifer and I are working on our 20th anniversary, and our three children range in age from 11 to 16. And then we have Snowy, our dog, uh, named by our eldest son uh, for a cartoon, no less. And uh, he just joined us just about four years ago. In addition to the family, uh, you'll note that you have uh, two interlocking rings. I'm part of an interfaith relationship. I'm Jewish. My wife is Catholic. And so we really are seeking out the best of all worlds as we raise our children. And that's an important journey for us. I teach Sunday school and have for, gosh, 10, 15 years now. Uh, so it's an important part of who I am and what I believe in in giving back. And then you'll see my parents, a critical part for everyone's lives, of course. And my mom and dad, you'll hear more about a little bit about, about my mom's specific journey in a bit. But what's critical uh, for you to understand is how I came into the space of serving older adults. It started actually in 2002. I was just completing a trip around the world with Jennifer. Uh, we weren't, weren't married at the time, but we were traveling together. It was a wonderful trip. And we came back to Oregon where I grew up. And when we came back, it was to uh, see my grandmother, my dad's mom, my grandma Lee. And when we arrived back, uh, she was uh, supposed to move into a senior living community. And unfortunately, the day before that move took place, she passed away and I was bedside with her. That was really compelling for me and it changed my life. It made me want to change my profession. I'd spent almost 10 years working in the telecommunications field. But I knew right there and then that I wanted to dedicate my life to taking the fear and anxiety out of the senior living space and replacing it with hope and purpose. And for the last 20 years, I'm honored to say that that is the journey I've been on and look forward to continuing uh, for many years to come. Why I'm so excited about that journey is, as you see in the next slide, there are so many older adults to be considered. And this is a chart that showcases the doubling of the 75 plus population over the next 20 years. The doubling of the 75 plus population over the next 20 years which is awesome. I think it's great. It's a testament to our healthcare system. It's a testament to all of you exercising more, getting healthy, staying healthy. Uh, kudos. It's something that we should be striving for and looking towards achieving. And at the same time, uh, we have a little bit different phenomena occurring with our workforce, as you can imagine. And I'm sure you've been hearing about a lot lately, which you'll see on the next slide. And this is the following birth rates in our country. So at the same time that we're doubling the number of older adults, we're having the lowest number of babies. And that means that we won't have much of a workforce to, to really come around all the needs of older adults in the future. I could, would contend that today we don't have that as it stands. And it makes it very difficult for people. 
uh, certainly for consumers to figure out what to do. And then certainly for organizations like ours, it makes it a key emphasis to focus on being an organization of welcome for all, because we, we rely on such a strong immigrant population to provide services and support to residents and members. But overall, we need to figure out how to showcase that this is a worthy field for the youth of America to come into. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the programs and efforts we're doing to make that a reality. As we come into the next slide, we'll talk about what to do as a consumer. You know, before the, the pandemic, which has been a really big challenge for everyone in the world, and certainly we're no exception here in this area, consumers were struggling to figure out what to do for care. There was a, an article that caught my attention in the Washington Post back in August of 2019, again, before the pandemic. And the article talked about what was going on in the state of Maine. I'm sure many of you have visited Maine before and have family up there maybe. And you might have heard that Maine has one of the oldest populations in the country. They're sort of a bellwether for where we're heading as a country. At the same time that they have one of the oldest populations, they also have a workforce challenge. They cannot find enough hands to provide the care. And the article went on to talk about even when people were paying $50 an hour for a certified nursing assistant, they just could not find staff. In fact, we had a colleague here whose parents were living in Maine and chose to move away from the state because they didn't have confidence that when they needed care, care would be available for them. So what is a consumer to do? From my estimation, what a consumer is best to do is find an organization that is really focused on staff and making sure that that organization has their back in the future, be it as becoming a member of a program like Goodwin House at Home or moving into one of our communities, becoming and tying yourself up with a very reputable organization, I think is the best antidote to all the challenges that are coming forward in terms of staffing. And then you'd ask yourself, well, what makes you so special as an organization? What are you doing to make sure that you can come around and be a provider of choice? Great question. And there's a lot of different answers. And I'll just highlight a few of them today in terms of the actions we've taken as an organization over the last two and a half years. And I'd say even before I arrived into uh, two and a half years ago, had started to take. But when I did uh, arrive in service to Goodwin House, one of the first things I chose to do was embark on a listening tour with all the new staff, the longest tenured staff, in addition to new residents and longest tenured residents. I wanted to understand where people were coming from and how they saw the needs of the organization. From those discussions and listening tours, what I learned was we have a lot to work on in terms of pay structures. Now, I arrived in July of 2019, right before our budget season. Actually, we, we kick off that budget season and sort of approve everything in that July, August uh, timeframe for the new year, which starts for us in October. That's our fiscal year. And when we were having that discussion, I realized quickly that we needed to alter how we were looking at pay structures for staff based on that feedback. And so at the time when I arrived, we were paying $11.75 an hour for uh, baseline staff at, for many of them at the lowest level. And we made a concerted commitment to raise that up to $18 an hour by next year, by 2023. We've already increased that by 45%. We're at $17 an hour minimum pay today, and we'll be at $18 uh, next year, as I mentioned. That's a 53% increase in just three years. Now you may ask yourself, my goodness, Rob, with all of those increases of pay structures, you must be increasing the pay or the expenses and the fees of residents and members uh, to an extraordinary level. And I would say we certainly aren't increasing it by 53% over the course of three years. In fact, with residents in Goodwin House Alexandria and Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads, we've committed to not increasing our rates by more than 3.8%. And uh, we've been able to meet that goal and objective. And we've only been able to do that because we've become more efficient as an organization, looking for opportunities where we could have savings without impacting the experience of either our members or our residents. So it's a commitment for us to get to what we call a living wage or a competitive wage for our staff. And we were glad we started that before all of these things had happened with the, the pandemic, because had we not, we'd be much further behind and probably needing to increase rates for our residents much faster. Luckily, the foresight allowed us to have an even pace, and our residents have been extraordinarily supportive of our efforts to date. 
We also recognized that we needed to invest in recruiting. Uh, at the time when I arrived, our managers who were expected to do a lot of the work and oversight uh, were also expected to do the recruiting of new staff. Well, we welcomed in nearly 400, we're on pace to welcome in nearly 400 new staff uh, this year. And with that reality, with a lot of new positions being hired and existing positions being refilled, managers don't really have time to recruit as today's recruiting is required. Just like you, when you call, we hope we make a call back to you within 24 to 48 hours, hopefully 24 hours. We know that you have lots of choices and that we hope we are the choice that you make, but we have to be responsive to you as members, as, as uh, prospects. The same thing is very true today. You really need to get back to staff within four, four hours, otherwise you're unlikely to secure them for the future. And with four new recruiters, we've been able to do, be much more effective at our responsiveness. We also recognize that everyone, inclusive of this group who's with us today, looks at us through the lens of the internet. You look at websites, our website, but you also look at other sites that show reviews of us. And we had to make sure that those reviews reflected who we are as an organization, an intentional organization of welcome, one that really embraces diversity and equality and inclusion. And so we wanted to make sure that our websites and all the different ways that people could find out about us reflected that. And we made an intentional effort to improve um, how those were viewed. That's been helpful. And really, uh, we encourage you to leave a message for us in the social media atmosphere anytime you'd like. We've also sought out new ways to bring on people and keep them with us. We had a resident in 2018, Rita Siebenhaller from Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads, who said, I'm noticing with the number of our staff that they really would like to seek out citizenship, but there's a $725 fee for the application process. I wonder if our foundation could step forward and help those individuals. And within two weeks of that idea being hatched, we were able to raise $40,000 to encourage um, many of our staff to go through the citizenship process. And that program has continued to grow and grow and grow. And today, just four years later, we're now over 100 staff who've gone, through, gone about getting their citizenship process, which is really exciting, all supported by the Goodwin House Foundation. As I mentioned to you, one of the key things that we had to figure out as an organization was how to save resources, save money, so we didn't have to increase rates for our residents and br bring those savings and put them right back into our staff in the form of increases in their wages. One of the key things we saw early on was that we had a long-term relationship with a third-party vendor which was costing us a lot of money and wasn't necessarily providing us the best continuity of care for our residents. So we were able to bring in-house our therapy services, which was an important step for us, a major savings, and allowed us to put those dollars right back into supporting our staff and providing better support for our residents in that case. We also are probably one of the only organizations in the last 20 years that I've been in service to older adults that is intentionally refinancing for the purpose of being able to increase the pay structures for our staff without having to increase dramatically the pay uh, fees for our residents and members. And that's a process we're going through right now, seeking out over a million dollars of savings a year in debt service, just by finding, uh, by asking key questions of curiosity and finding opportunities to be more efficient. As we look at the next slide, you'll notice that that focus of intentionality is paying off. Over the last three years, as we've applied for the top Place, uh, top workplace considerations within the Washington Post. We've been really proud to be in the top 10 of our category. Our category is competitive against all other employers, not just senior living providers in our market. And that is a real testament to the work ethic of our staff, but the real love our staff have of the residents and members that they are in service to. They just really feel a sense of family in a positive way uh, amongst our residents and our staff. And you can see it consistently day in and day out. This is a picture, in fact, of Audrey Keith. I just saw her as I was getting some food earlier today. Uh, and she has been with us for 51 years, working on 52 years as of August. And she'll talk about that feeling of family, that this is really a connective organization that means so much to her. And she keeps on coming up with new ideas and embracing new ways to get better and better and better. So even though we're a top workplace, we're not being complacent, we have work to do, and we'll continue to work at it uh, day in and day out. As we come into the next slide, 
what you'll notice is our focus on purpose. So as an organization, we understand that everyone, no matter what level of service you're experiencing, you wanna wake up with a sense to make the world better. I mean, some days it's really hard to see those paths forward, but we as Goodwin House should be really good facilitators of those opportunities. Our residents flock to those opportunities. Our members seek those opportunities out. Our staff really embraces the chance to be a broader positive influence in the general market. So you'll see that a lot of times Goodwin House, when it comes up in the news, it's for programs that we're pushing forward with, be it citizenship, as we've talked about, or high school programs and mentorship within local high schools. Uh, we're really excited. We've been bringing on more and more interns and uh, those opportunities to mentor those interns and raise them up and provide them professional guidance has been critical to our success, we believe, and becoming uh, a stronger employer of choice in the market and welcoming new people into the field. As I said, we're experiencing the lowest birth rates. So what we're gonna need to do is compete as one of the best places to work, no matter who you are, so that you consider us for the future. You'll also notice we've been able to invest in significant programs, be it art programs, music programs, or horticultural programs. Much of the ability to do that has come through our Goodwin House Foundation. Because we have two amazing communities that are basically full, uh, fully built out and are not gonna grow anymore, we wanna be really cautious and conscientious not to add a lot of new positions to those communities. But at the same time, we wanna be able to differentiate ourselves in the market relative to all the other options. The first options being staying at home, which is great for a lot of people. That's why we have our Goodwin House at Home product and services. But for many people who are looking at other communities to move into or choose, we want to be able to differentiate ourselves from them. And the Goodwin House Foundation allows us to do that without adding expense to the resident experience by the donations, the generous donations of individuals such as myself, uh, staff, but certainly a number of residents, family members, and community members in general. What those donations have allowed us to do is establish music therapy programs in both of our communities, both at Goodwin House Alexandria and Goodwin House Baelish Crossroads. We have music therapists in both locations. We have robust art programs in both locations. We also have a wonderful horticultural program called Elder Grow that is existing in both locations. All of these are supported by efforts with our foundation. In fact, our foundation has allowed us to be really differentiating also with our staff. If you think about all the parts that we need to do to support staff. Continuing education is one of the key elements. So that's been a key area of focus and allowing uh, up to 80 staff members last year to work on their continuing education goals and dreams. Foundation is, becomes a very important part of our success as a faith-based not-for-profit. You'll also note that our residents are wanting to make a difference in the general community. So they're making mats for homeless out of plastic bags. What kind of innovation is that? It's wonderful innovation. They're supporting programs such as Lazarus Ministry, Carpenter uh, Shelter, Colmore Clinic, and so many more with their time and energy and efforts. They're preparing food bags for, to fight out against food insecurity. And that's continuing ongoing at various levels of uh, service. You know, in assisted living and memory care, residents are still getting involved in giving back to the general community, which we love to see. It's always nice to see that. And uh, I think we just keep on getting pushed by our residents to do more and more and more. Today and tomorrow, we have opportunities for people to bring in medical supplies in line with the Minister of Health from the Ukraine and be able to ship those items back to Ukraine, uh, at least to the border in Poland, for people to be able to use uh, for the betterment of those suffering in, in challenges. So we're really excited about that uh, continued effort that our residents bring to us and our members bring to us and our ability to react positively uh, to those efforts. Ultimately, we are focused on supporting a lot of other not-for-profits in the area, and we're really proud of those uh, opportunities that we have created and received. When we turn to the next slide, you'll see a very big focus of our person-centered approach. Both at Goodwin House Baelish Crossroads and Goodwin House Alexandria, both communities are five-star rated as it relates to the care and services we provide for skilled nursing. That is the highest level that the rating uh, CMS provides. And we've been that way for years. 
and I expect will be that way for years. We're a quality oriented organization and we don't want to skimp on making sure the experience of our residents, or our members, or our guests are at the absolute best possible. In addition to that, we keep on investing, as I mentioned earlier, in innovation, in innovative ways to make ourselves better. So we came around and invested nearly $70 million here at Goodwin House Alexandria to create a small house model. This is a model that's quite unique where we have neighborhoods of skilled nursing versus uh, longer hallways, which may be more traditional. Now we still love the work that we're doing in longer hallways, like at Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads, and we do it with great care and support. But this new model of smaller, the small house model is what we call it, uh, is really unique and provides a, an environment where you have a neighborhood of just 10 people. And within those 10 people, you have a very high concentration of support and services provided. Uh, it makes for dignity uh, to be very much at the forefront of what we do. And the residents in this case really dictate a lot of their daily rhythms and how they want things done. Uh, they even get to dictate a lot of how the, they want the food uh, to be. So it's been a really good journey to see uh, from the start. That journey, as you'll see in the next slide, is not something that we want to just hold on to. If we see that we've made mistakes as an organization, we want to share those mistakes and have other people learn from them. We want to be able to take our wins and share those too. And so what you'll see from us as a faith-based not-for-profit organization is that we are doing our best to turn what is going on uh, and turn it to the general community. We think it's the right thing to do. It's the right corporate thing to do. It's the right citizenship thing to do, to be a community citizen, not just focused on what we're doing in our own communities or with our own members. So three examples of that, uh, most of recent in the last couple of years, one is how we responded to the pandemic. Now, you can imagine, and I'm sure for many of you, the pandemic has been very challenging, and certainly it has been for us as well. We've had our losses. We've had our staff. We've lost spouses and family members. It's been a harrowing time. With that said, I think we've navigated it as best we could, and we've done it in a way that has allowed people to be supported through the experience. When we saw early on that people weren't able to get uh, protective equipment, we actually brought a group of over 65 organizations together and pre-ordered, purchased, put money down in advance for those organizations and ourselves to receive the personal protective equipment that was necessary. That kind of coordination and effort really brought a whole region together as we were supporting hospitals and others uh, from Maryland uh, and Virginia and DC uh, to, to betterment in the moment where it was really hard to figure it out. But that's what a faith-based not-for-profit organization does. Where others can't, we try to find a way to help. And that's been really important. Ultimately, we created a full pandemic playbook for any organization, not just senior living organizations to follow. So if they needed support or advice on how to get through this time, uh, we wanted to be there for them. We started to work with groups uh, like Campania Center to do the testing for them and to help them with guidance on how to help uh, make sure they can have kids come and get the good benefits of their programming without being worried about COVID. So being able to be an open access organization uh, remains really important to us. As Sue mentioned, the program Stronger Memory, this has been a wonderful gift in addition to the Goodwin House family. Stronger Memory is a program that is based on very simple, very accessible tools. The idea that if you can read out loud, handwrite, and do simple math quickly, 20 minutes a day, that if you do it for four, or at least four times, five times a week, that you can really push off the cognitive symptoms of decline. Now, you may not be able to change or have a cure for dementia, which we know that that doesn't exist yet, but to be able to push off symptoms for a year, three years, 10 years, that could be compelling, not just for our residents here, but for the world in, as a whole. I've seen this personally with my mom, who back 10 years ago was having problems remembering things. She's get forgetful about what she was talking about and even get lost in familiar places. And within a month of starting these three things, reading out loud, handwriting, and doing basic math quickly, she was able to divert those uh, challenges. She hasn't had those challenges since. And for 10 years, she's been on a wonderful path. Well, I was challenged by a good friend to see if we could help many other people. And that's what we did as an organization. Goodwin House is proud in June of 2020 to provide stronger memory to anyone and everyone 
so that everyone can follow the path that my mom has experienced and the path that many of our residents and members have experienced here at Goodwin House. Really positive results for very little investment of time and energy. If you're interested in that program, you also can find that at strongermemory.com or on our website and when you go to Stronger Memory within the Goodwin House platform. With that, we wanted to share it with as many people as possible. And as Sue mentioned, it is now a national program growing every day with hundreds and thousands of individuals using the program. And we're really excited for its results. And George Mason University is excited because they're doing a lot of research on it and seeing such positive brain health intervention results as well. Finally, an example of citizenship. As I mentioned, our residents came up with the idea that we should be paying for our residents, our staff to be able to get their citizenship. And so we said, absolutely, let's do that. The idea was so well liked that just recently, Voice of America came and did a whole program to see uh, more about the program and, and really showcase it to the rest of the world. And so when we get there in just a moment, you'll see that video clip from them. But this program started off with just an idea from a resident that has helped, as I mentioned, nearly uh, over 100 uh, of our staff so far. And now the program has taken on such an importance that we are now offering the chance for staff, if they have someone in their family that needs to go down the citizenship process, they too can do that through the generosity of the foundation. It feels really right. And we've been able to create a full citizenship playbook so that anyone in the country can follow us and do the exact same thing that we've done and have really great success with their staff and help more and more people see that we are certainly employee friendly, regardless of where you come from. Uh, that's an important key, I think, to the future success of our organization and our country to welcome in as many people that want to work here as we can. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. And you'll see, it'll be a little bit of delay, but I think you'll see a wonderful video uh, with our residents and our staff. Who was the second United States president? Oh, John Adams. John, John Adams, Adams, yes. So Questions like these might stump many American citizens. One of the most famous conductors on the Underground Railroad. Uh, I'll, um, Harriet Tubman. But these immigrants pursuing citizenship are determined. Is it Susan B. Anthony. Yes, Susan B. Anthony. And so are the retirement home residents prepping them to take their citizenship exams. This staffer refers to his tutor as father. What do we call the first 10 amendments to the Constitution? The Bill of Rights. My father asked me a lot of questions. Even the questions, some of them is, is, not, is not in the book. But he, he also asked uh, ask me and then I give him the answer. So I have to keep it in my mind. The people who live at Goodwin House in Northern Virginia are doing more than just tutoring the migrants who work there. When residents learned that the $725 filing cost for citizenship was prohibitive, they decided to raise money to help the immigrant workers who do so many things for them. Citizenship for the people who have met all the requirements should not be such an expensive proposition. In 2018, resident Rita Siebenaller launched the program whereby residents would pay the cost for migrant staffers to file citizenship papers. So we put out the word and through a combination of resident donations and staff donations, we had about $40,000 in two weeks. It took us a little time to convince staff that this was real and that they should consider it. But after the first few, people applied for the citizenship grant and then studied for the exam and got their citizenship. It was just like wildfire. Hello, Ms. Sayson. Good morning to you. Hello, ma'am. Good ma morning. How are you? Maribel Karen Seha is the dining services manager at Goodwin House. Residents paid for her to become a citizen. She's bonded tightly to them. I come to work not only for the money. I give my 100% and my love to them. You know, I treat each and every one of them as, as my family. Goodwin House President Rob Liebrick says the staff members come from 68 different countries and that the elder care industry is becoming increasingly reliant on immigrant workers. 
Roughly one in four workers in long-term care facilities is an immigrant, he says. We're going to be doubling the size of the senior living population in the next 20 years of the 75-year-olds. And at the same time, we have the lowest birth rates in our country that we've ever had. And so we really need to find people to come in and provide hands-on care, support, etc. And that's where the immigrant population is so critical. I forget uh, when the Civil War started, do you remember? It was 1861 and 1865. Nak Uyen was regularly quizzed by residents when she was pursuing citizenship. They were searching for more information and provide me, help me to understand more about the American history and um, yeah, and how to become a citizen, not only to pass the citizenship test, but also how, how to be a good citizen. What rights do a citizen have to vote? Ninety immigrant staffers at Goodwin House have engaged in the citizenship grant process, forging friendships with their older teachers along the way. Which state has the most people? California. California. Okay. Laurel Bowman, VOA News, Alexandria, Virginia. Great. What a wonderful video. I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed that. And actually, uh, just yesterday, we were able to celebrate with Eric, uh, who was highlighted in that video, his uh, successful citizenship uh, processing. So a big deal for all those residents involved and certainly for Eric and all of his family members involved. And earlier this week, we were able to go and celebrate with the Afghan allies and welcome in uh, 200 new people from Afghanistan who are now relocating and, and finding new homes here in the United States. That's the type of organization we are. We look forward to welcoming everyone with intentionality, with love, with joy, uh, with our mission in hand. And we certainly welcome your questions along the way. As I know, I'll turn this over and back to you, Sue. Thank you, Rob. Every time I hear him speak, I am just so grateful to be here. And um, I would just like to comment on a couple of things that, that Rob said um, that um, are very personal. Um, he stated that he had a he had a personal experience, and that was one of the reasons that he joined senior living. And I too had a personal experience, in that um, my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when he was 65 years old, and um, it, I wish he had had stronger memory. I wish he had had access to that program, because maybe we would have been able to delay the effects of that terrible disease for for many more years than we were able to. And my mom who, as you know, lives at Goodwin House Alexandria, um, knew firsthand, she saw firsthand um, what my, my dad went through. And she's participating in the Stronger Memory Program. And um, while she really wasn't experiencing any strong memory deficits, um, she's definitely improved and her memory is getting stronger. And so I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful as a, a manager who sometimes has to hire new staff members um, for all that we do for our employees, because I talk about that in interviews. When I have a strong candidate who I feel can deliver the excellence that we are looking for in this organization, I tell them about what Goodwin House does for their employees, how Goodwin House treated their employees during the pandemic, um, how we shared the playbook with our community um, so that other people might be able to to manage something like the COVID-19 pandemic the way that we did. And um, I tell them about the citizenship program. And they are so impressed by all that Goodwin House does for their employees that um, they often, they join us. And, and we have some, some new stronger members of our team as a result of all of that. So um, thank you, Rob. Thank you for, for sharing all of those stories. There was a lot of information there. Um, before we move on to our questions and answers and give you an opportunity to ask some direct questions to Rob, um, I would like to transition to the next slide just to tell you a little bit about some of our upcoming events. On April the 6th, we will be hosting a downsizing event on site in the community at Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads featuring author and professional downsizer Margaret Novak. The invitations for that event are in the mail right now. Um, in addition, on the next slide, 
uh, some exclusive events for our Priority Club members are coming up. We will host the next Coffee Talk in our series of Coffee Talks at Goodman House Alexandria on April the 28th. Um, and we'll be hearing from our culinary team during that presentation, learn a little bit more about what they do. We are pleased to offer our Priority Club members an open house at both of our communities on May 4th and May 11th. This is something that our Priority Club members look forward to every year. And because of COVID, we've not been able to do it for the last two years. So we're really looking forward to this event. If you are currently a Priority Club member, you will be receiving an invitation to these events. If you are not a Priority Club member and your plan includes the possibility of becoming a resident at Goodwin House Alexandria or Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads, we urge you to become a Priority Club member. Doing so puts your name on the wait list for the apartment of your choice and gives you the opportunity to enjoy other benefits such as these exclusive events. And likewise, if you're interested in joining Good One House at Home and becoming a member of that organization, that community, um, we have some contact information that we'll put up on the screen a little later so that you can reach out to either the Life Plan communities or a Good One House at Home, depending on what your plan is for your future. As we move toward our question and answer period, I would like to thank those of you who entered questions on the registration form and sent them to us ahead of time. Rob will answer some of those in just a minute. We also received questions like the ones you'll see on the next slide. And questions like this are specific to the life plan communities. And there they are, and are best answered by a sales counselor. We encourage you to make an appointment to meet with one of our sales counselors so that you can see our communities, meet residents who will share details of their lives and have your questions answered. And by the way, yes, we do have charging stations for electric cars. On the next slide is a picture of the team of sales professionals who look forward to meeting you if you're interested in one of our life plan communities. From time to time, we do have a bowling outing which is, as you can see in this picture, what we were doing on that day. We may not strike you as bowlers, but we do enjoy bowling in our spare time. And so if you'll forgive me for that pun, um, please notice our contact information on the next screen. And this is how you can reach us if you're interested in either Goodwin House at Home or in the life plan communities. And so now it's time to answer some of your questions. So first I'll go to Rob, I'll go to the questions that were pre-submitted, okay? And I'll, I'll read them to you one at a time. So is Goodwin House expecting to have to increase its fees beyond inflation? That's a good question. Sue, that's a great oh. question. And by the way, I loved your bowling puns. Uh, you got oh. to get some points for that. Thank you, the, Rob. Um, I'm sure the audience was laughing. We just couldn't hear them. Yeah, right. We didn't lose too many of them either, so that's good. <laughs> the uh, the question about inflation is a good one, and I don't think I don't think anyone on this call actually wants us to keep the uh, inflation rate, the rate that we do resident or member increases. I think right now the inflation rate is running close to eight percent, um, so we're not intending to have an eight percent increase uh, based on inflation for our residents or for our members. Uh, with that said, uh, we know that there are a lot of pressures right now, and the pressures are real. Uh, certainly, we're we're watching a war unfold, and it's having uh, undue pressure on fuel, on on food, uh, certainly on lives. Uh, probably most important, obviously, but uh, in terms of the price increase factors. And so, as an organization, we're looking for other ways to be more efficient. And as I said, I think we are the first uh, organization that I've seen in 20 years that is refinancing our debt so that we can have a lower debt payment process, so we can cover a lot of the costs that we're incurring to um, to the increased wages and increased expenses that we're managing. So I don't expect we'll, we'll have uh, major increases based on the inflationary pressures, uh, but we'll have to keep uh, really astute uh, and be really good uh, stewards of the resources. Okay, great, thank you. Um, you addressed some of this, but the, still there's the follow-up question. What is Goodwin House doing to attract and retain quality staff 
at a time when many are leaving the industry? Yeah, it's, it's the biggest issue that we have over the next 20 years is how to attract and retain great staff. And our, our average tenure, as I shared with you, is six years. Uh, so we're really great once we get people. They stick with us for a long time. Uh, and hopefully uh, that, that is a testament to people like Audrey Keith, who have been with us for 52 plus years. And so sharing their stories, uh, making sure we're listening to our staff, making sure that we are as accessible as possible to as many people as possible to make sure that we're giving them the tools that they need to succeed. That's really at the core of what we're doing today. And uh, making sure we have the tools to support our managers because oftentimes, and I'm sure many of our participants here would say, people don't leave organizations, they leave managers. So making sure our managers, our directors are well supported, well uh, educated on how best to support individuals and individuals in their growth. That's why I'm so excited for the last two years that we've had, what, 75 people and then last year, 80 people take advantage of new educational pathways and ongoing education opportunities supported by the foundation. I think the more we can do those type of programs, the more likely, likely we are to retain staff and be a beacon for place for people to come to in the first place. Okay, great. How has the pandemic affected Goodwin House's census and financial status? So you might be best to talk about census, but from my vantage point, uh, we certainly had some census decline as it relates to our skilled nursing services and our assisted living services early on with the pandemic, but to the real talent and willingness and ability of you, your team, we haven't really seen a major census decline as it relates to independent living uh, options. And we've seen the growth of our Goodwin House at Home membership. So I think that's a testament to who we are as an organization. But as I've talked to a number of residents who've moved in during the pandemic, what they tell me is that they're, they weren't gonna be better off staying in their homes. But when they got here, they found a whole support network. Or if they joined as a Goodwin House at Home member, they had one number to call should they need any support. They really had that support network available to them. So I've seen uh, a lot of, of people share their appreciation for us being available during the time of a pandemic as an option to move into, which I think is counter what a lot of people would have thought. Uh, it's been amazing to see us stay in that 95%, 96% occupancy uh, throughout the process. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that, Rob, that um, one thing that I think was you know, very much a part of the teamwork that was involved in keeping our census strong was the communication that we were constantly doing with our staff but also with all of our stakeholders. So as an example, every week we sent out an email, our communications team sent out an email to what we called the friends and family of Goodwin House. So basically anybody who wanted to receive that email because they were interested in what Goodwin House was doing would receive that every Friday. And we were very transparent in all of the information that we were providing about what we were doing every week what changes we were making every week in regard to COVID-19. And people really, really appreciated hearing from us on a regular basis, knowing what we were doing. And I think that really helped to um, make people feel that this was the right move for them and that they were going to be able to stay safe, yet have some sociability and not feel so alone. Absolutely. So it looks like this is our final question, Rob, and this is, what does the Goodwin House Foundation support? My goodness, Sue, uh, we could spend an hour just on all the things and ways that the foundation really supports uh, the organization, but ultimately you've heard a lot of those stories today. You've heard a lot about how the foundation supports the education growth of our staff. You've heard a lot about how the foundation has supported programs like Stronger Memory. Our brain health programming comes through the generosity and support of the foundation and allows us not only to support our residents internally, but really a whole nation with that opportunity in that program. It also has supported our music therapy programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the things I think people don't realize is during COVID, uh, the foundation was able to provide an additional $500,000 of support to our staff because the economic challenges that so many were going through were real and severe. 
And so being able to come around our staff in those moments with real dollars, be it grants for 500 or a thousand dollars at a time or grocery cards because getting food was hard uh, or whatever it might have been was really important. And the foundation was at the forefront of that. But ultimately, the foundation was formed first and foremost to support our residents, to make sure that residents who come into our communities, if they have by no fault of their own run out of finances, that they are going to be able to live with us forever. And that is the real testament to a faith-based not-for-profit. Uh, I've been with for-profit entities before, and they feel great, and you do a lot of good work, but if a resident can't afford to live there, they don't live there anymore. They have to find a different place. Whereas with Goodwin House, once you've moved here, uh, and again, by no fault of your own, you've run out of resources, we're here for you. And that's a major difference. And that's what the foundation ultimately supports. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. And uh, to those of you who may have submitted some questions, um, we did notice that many of them are specifically about our residences, apartments, life in our life plan communities. And so again, we encourage you uh, to make an appointment and come in and talk to us about it. That's the best way to get those types of questions answered. So thank you all for joining us in this webinar today. Thank you, Rob, for being our guest speaker. Um, and um, stay safe and stay engaged.